Okay. Are you ready? Okay, our third and final talk of the day is Mr. Walsh, who will speak on the work of PRE net functions. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Tim Walsh. That's what I was talking about bed functions. So, just a quick kind of agenda. Uh, we'll start with an introduction, kind of give you a backdrop of why we're investigating bent functions in the first place. Uh, it's it's a relatively new area, uh, you know, in terms of you know, how old math actually is. So, uh, it's important to actually talk about why we're looking at it in the first place. Next, we'll do some uh, definitions. Uh, it's going to be kind of kind of boring around that area, honestly, because I just have to <laughs> rattle rattle a lot of. Uh, you know, different, different concepts at you and hope that it sticks. And then we'll get into the, uh, the bread and butter, the important theorems that we use to get to our main results, uh, which is where we try to characterize a, uh, a set of bent functions on a finite field of order three to the n. Uh, and then conclusion, further considerations for research, et cetera. And then questions at the end. Start with our introduction. So the uh, topic we, we start with is a linear feedback shift register, which is, you know, it's a it's a way to generate a sequence of numbers based on previous states. And uh, as we see, the the biggest example I can think of, you know, the easiest one is the Fibonacci sequence. If you mod it out to, it creates this nice periodic uh, sequence of zeros and ones, and uh, it's good for using as a a key stream in a cipher system where if you have a list of zeros and ones as your message. You can just add this key to it, and that's a simple encryption of a uh, of a plain text. And so you get this cipher text, and that's how you code. However, the problem with these linear uh, registers is that because of the uh, the periodicity of them, you can break them. They've they've uh, had an algorithm designed for 40 to 50 years now. They can break all of these. Uh, some of them aren't easy, but it can be done. So. Uh, the big one that, that we looked at is the Berlekamp Massey algorithm, which says that if your uh, key has length n and the period is maximal of, uh, at 2 to the n minus 1, then you can take 2n consecutive terms of your, of your ciphertext and use that to break the entire thing. Like I said, not always easy. In our example here, where we use the Fibonacci sequence, it's actually really easy. Um, but as, as I stated, they can be done. And so what we want to do now is look at bent functions which do not take this linearity and thus they are more resistant to the kinds of methods that are currently used to break linear feedback shift registers. So most people look at bent functions and then instantly question mark over their head. So start with the definition of a bent function. We start with the walsh hadamard transform which is analogous to a Fourier transform, it looks you know, pretty much the same. And that's where you take the sum over all of the vectors in your field, which in our case, you know, GFP to the N, you could, you could compare it to Z, Z, P, you know, for instance, uh, just to find a field of order P. Um, and so you take this uh, walsh hadamard transform, which is the P root of unity, raised to the power of f of x minus the inner product of u and x, uh, where u is the vector you're finding the transform on. And if you have a function from gfp to the n to gfp, it's bent if your walsh hadamard transform is p to the n minus 2 for all of the vectors in your field. So, next, the other, uh, the other big thing we're going to look at is partial difference sets. These play into how we characterize the bent functions later. So if we start with a finite abelian group of order b, and you take a subset of cardinality k, you say that it's a different set if the list of d1, d2 inverse, uh, we call a multi-set basically just a set that allows repetition of elements. Uh, if this set contains every non-identity non element of g, uh, exactly lambda times you know, Lambda isn't a you know, defined constant, it's just that constant is true for all of the uh, all of the D1, D2s. And we say it's a partial different set if that same multi-set contains every non-identity element of D lambda times and every non-identity element of G minus D mu times. So there we're, we're breaking G up and looking at two sides of it. So multi-set is just something that allows to have the same element? Yeah, it's just a set where you can repeat elements. And so that's important because when we 
when we run all these differences through, you'll see that as we as we need, they need to repeat a certain amount of times in order to check whether we have a different set or a partial different set. So there are things like unions and intersections and uh, symmetric differences and everything might work differently for these and for ordinary sets. In in some cases, yes. Uh, we'll see later that um, we do a, a certain kind of operation between between sets and. Yeah, the multi-set is important because then you, you check to see if there's a certain multiple of an entire set within that output. So we'll, we'll show it later, but yeah, it, it is a little bit So next, we're looking at Cayley graphs. An example you have in front of you, we'll, we'll refer later to. But um, the Cayley graph is just uh, a set of vertices you know, based off of group G. And then um, you take a subset of G uh, without the identity. You can't have the identity of screws up the whole thing. And you say that two vertices on the graph are connected by a directed edge from G1 to G2, for instance, if G2 is equivalent to G1 times D for some D. Um, with most of our examples, this is just, you know, multiplicative notation, but we'll actually use addition and subtraction as our operation for a lot of our uh, work moving forward. And then we have this definition that if you have a partial difference set with these parameters, your Cayley graph is a strongly regular graph with the same parameters if you have V vertices, that's so just the order of G, uh, such that each vertex is connected to K other vertices, and distinct vertices share edges with either lambda or mu common vertices. So this is what we have so far, uh, not in the case we're looking at, but in binary cases of functions. Two ways to easy ways, but strong ways to determine whether a function is bends or not. So the Dillon correspondence, uh, written by John Dillon in 1974, he's a uh, he works for the NSA as a cryptographer, and uh, his his theorem says that your function is bent if and only if the level curve f inverse of one yields a different set in g up to the n with these parameters. And so this is easy to check because you just you look at all of the elements that you know get sent to one. And you just uh, you go back and you you do what we did here, where you do all the differences. And you just have to check that it matches these parameters here for any integer, m, and that's how you know. And then Bernasconi correspondence written in 2001, in that area 2000, 2001, says that your function is bent if your Cayley graph is a strongly regular graph with the following parameters: of your number of vertices to the n, obviously, that's the field you're working in. K, you know, the, the size of the subset, D, and then mu and lambda are defined as such, mu equals lambda, yeah. So, we're looking at now, however, since we're in GF, you know, three, which is our main result, but you can do it beyond that, is that if you take a level curve, you don't just get, you know, one set because you have different, you know, numbers to take uh, inverse images off of, you know, for us we have one and two, to look at. So we look at what's called a weighted partial difference set where you know you, you kind of build the same way you start with your group G, you take a subset D, but then you decompose it into a, uh, a disjoint unit. And then we're just saying that the order of D sub I is K sub I, just to carry that notation forward from the definition of partial difference sets. And so again we say that D is a weighted partial difference set if Multi-set D I times D J inverse uh, represents every non-identity element of D sub L uh, exactly lambda I J L times again. That's just another constant that we determine, and every non-identity element of G minus D mu I J times. And then the other condition, which changes because we don't have to worry about multiple sets in a partial difference set, is that for each I in your uh, in your set of integers there, there has to be a j such that di inverse equals d sub j. And when we say d inverse, it just means you take the negatives of all the elements in your set. And then if if your set you know inverse is equal to itself, then your partial difference set is symmetric. And as we go forward, when we get to our main result, we'll see that we're dealing with partial difference sets where every uh, set is symmetric. And then, again, we, had, we apply this concept of weights to the Cayley graph, where, you know, we construct the graph the same way, 
you know, we have we have G as a group, D as a subset, we decompose D. But then we add a, a weight to all the edges based on what uh, what element D, you know, uh, connects the two vertices. So um, we'll run through an example now. So this is what I said, you know, I throw a lot of stuff and then try to work it together. So our example here is a GF3x mod the polynomial x squared minus 1, which is isomorphic to the field GF9. And here we're using addition as our operation. So we take our subset D to be 1, 2x, and 2x. And that's before we run through this multi-set of differences. And this is the whole thing listed out. Uh, our identity element is 0, so we don't even need to worry about it. And the elements of D are bolded. We have 2, 1, x, 2x there. So you see that each element of D appears once in the list. So our lambda parameter is 1. And then if you check the rest of the non bold face elements, they each appear twice. So our mu is 2. Now what we'll do with this, we'll decompose D into two different sets. D sub 1 is 1 and 2. D sub 2 is x and 2x. We do the same thing. So for all of our elements in D sub 1, we run through this multi set. You get one copy of d sub 1 in there, and nothing in d sub 2. So our, our uh, lambda 1, 1, 1 equals 1, lambda 1, 1, 2 equals 0, and u 1, 1 equals 0. And you just run through that the, uh, the same way for the other, the other uh, set. And now your handout, which is what we look at next, this is the Cayley graph that corresponds with it. So if you look, uh, edges that are red, are, uh, they correspond to D sub 2, edges that are blue correspond to D sub 1, and so you see that, for instance, you know, the edge connecting 0 and 1 is blue because the difference between them is 1, which is in D sub 1. The edge that connects 2x plus 1 and x plus 1 is red because the difference is x, x is in D sub 2. And so that's how you construct this graph, you know, kind of a simple construction. So, like I said earlier, the way we're going to use these with our bent functions is we're going to take GFP to the n, and we're going to use the d sub i as level curves of the function. You know, so for each for each i in GFP, we take all of the vectors that map to that element, and that's our d sub i. So, conventionally, we say that d sub zero is just a zero element, and then d sub p is everything else except the zero element that gets mapped to zero. So next we talk about association schemes. In our research, we found that this was a more common term used, but it's an easy correlation between this and the weighted partial difference set. So we start with a finite set S. Uh, we take sets of pairs on S, and we have to define specifically R sub zero is just the set of all x comma x. It's also called delta. Uh, you know, it's just you know, same elements. And then we have the dual, which is R sub i star, which is the set of x and y such that y of x is in R sub i. So um, if, you, if you want, you can make that analogous to the set inverses from the weighted partial difference set definition. And we say that this is a d-class association scheme if s, up, s cross s is the union of all those, and all of them are disjoint. Sounds familiar. For each i, there exists a j such that r sub i star equals r sub j. Again, kind of sounds familiar. And then we define this constant p sub i j x sub y, which is the size of the number of elements in S, the size of the, uh, yeah, the set of elements in S such that x sub z is in r sub i and z y is in r sub j. And so this is a, a constant that we denote p sub i j k. The k is not, is not an exponent. It's just another index that we, we tack on to that, that uh, number. And so this is, like I said, it's an easy correlation between the partial difference sets and the association schemes. Uh, you just set S equals G. R sub 0 is defined the same. R sub I is just all the elements in G cross G, such that G H inverse is in D sub I. And then R D plus 1 is the set of all G sub H, such that the difference is not in D.
Next, we'll talk about Shurings, which is kind of this this here. You know, I'll get down to it, but this is kind of the big the big part of our project. This is what we use mainly to characterize the functions that we look at. So again, you know, same definition. G is a finite group. You have these finite subsets, and for the operations here, we're going to use C sub i and C sub j as a sum of their elements in you know in the field you know, the complex numbers. C G. So, if we take this uh, the subalgebra genera generated by these sets, we call it assuring if it meets the following criteria: C sub zero is the identity element. Uh, it sounds familiar in our weighted partial difference set. D sub zero is the identity. G is the, uh, the union of all of these sets. And then, again, for each i, there's a j such that one is uh, the inverse is equal to the so this down here, yeah, we're just taking C sub i and C sub j as sums of their elements, and we're just going to multiply them out, and it should be equal to the sum of the elements in C sub k times some integer. And again, we use an example because this is just a whole lot of words. So we take our set to be the, uh, the six roots of unity. We break it off, d sub 0 is uh, 1, that's our identity. d sub 1 is zeta squared zeta to the fourth. Z, uh, d2 is zeta to the third, zeta to the fifth. And so the, yeah, like this, is, this is the template for how we would do that operation. You know, you just sum the elements up, multiply them, and you get that you have two of each element in d sub 2. And then, again, you run through it with the other, the other sets. And so you get this whole list of intersection numbers based on that one operation that you do across the uh, D sub i's. All right, lastly, uh, adjacency matrices. These are big too because we use these to find intersection numbers for the bent functions, which is how we characterize them. So again, S is a finite set. We take our uh, R sub i's to be the same pairs that we defined in the association scheme. And we say that the adjacency matrix for R sub L, for instance, is the M by M matrix whose ij entry is 1 is if S sub i and S sub j is in R sub L, or 0 otherwise. And so you can generate a subring of these uh, called the Bose-Mesner algebra if it meets these uh, qualifications. And Again, you'll see that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these look familiar. You know, if we have the transpose of one matrix is equal to the other, it's analogous to our negatives. Uh, and then this is uh, familiar too. It's the same exact operation, just multiplying matrices and checking that it has a certain multiple of another. And so it's easy to make these matrices based on either the weighted partial difference set or the graph. So if you, if you just have a partial difference set, you just say that the ijth entry is 1 if your i and j vector, if their difference is in d sub k or 0. Otherwise, if you have your matrix, you just say the ijth entry is 1 if two vertices j sub i, or g sub i and g sub j are connected by a weight, uh, an edge of weight k. So again, an easy construction. And these are, for the previous example, where you have your, uh, your graphs there, these are the two adjacency matrices that you find. This is the, uh, the edges of weight 1, the blue edges, and then the edges of weight 2, which are the red edges on your diagram. So. OK. <laughs> now we'll move on to the actual you know, important part of the, the presentation, which is where we start trying to characterize these functions and try to reach a conclusion on that. So, a lot of these assumptions for the next few proofs will look pretty much the exact same. So I'm just going to kind of skip reading them because you know you can follow them as we go along. But again, they all look familiar. G is your group. You take a subset D, decompose it. You have all of these, uh, you know, these uh, assumptions about them. And so we take a matrix P sub K, which is a, an array of all of the intersection numbers for that for the associated Schur ring. And we, we know that P sub 0 is just a diagonal matrix where each entry is the size of the D sub i's. And then for each, uh, for each of these matrices, 
the sum of the column is the order of the, the, the subset D that corresponds to that column. And so this gives us a kind of structure where once we start finding these intersection numbers, we can check that they all add up right and that we have the right ones. Uh, the next theorem, this is our pretty much our bread and butter. This is the, the big one that we use. Uh, and it actually it utilizes the adjacency matrices, matrices that we talked about earlier, where if you have this subring of uh, the Boseman's algebra of your adjacency matrices, and you do this operation, you know, uh, then you can find that your intersection numbers are defined by this equation uh, where all these are easy to compute. P sub n is, is given based on the function and the field you're using. The size of D sub k, you just take the level curve of k, and then the trace of the three uh, adjacency matrices is an easy calculation. Uh, for us, we had to do most of these calculations on our stage on a computer because we didn't really want to multiply 27 by 27 matrices out, you know, however many times we had to. But again, it's a, it's a relatively easy calculation. Um, and so that's how you find all the intersection numbers for these functions, which is how we'll characterize them. And then this one is just kind of a nifty trick to, uh, to show that the matrices of the intersection numbers are uh, kind of reflexive. You can, you can basically interchange the uh, variables on the D's and the P's, and you'll get, uh, you know, the same number. So if you, you know, for instance, know, you'll know that the, the sizes of these two uh, sets, and if you know one of these numbers, then you automatically know the other by this theorem. And it's an easy way, again, once you generate that matrix, you can just check that all of these, uh, these things uh, fall into place correctly. So, with all that in mind, well, yeah, main results. So, first we talk about functions from GF3 squared to GF3, and we assume that our function is even in pen, which is why we get a uh, symmetric weighted partial difference sets. And uh, these are the intersection numbers that you get. This is one case. So, we have one case where D sub 1 and D sub 2 are both of size 2, and then you get these uh, arrays of numbers. And then the next one, the other case, is if d sub 1 and d sub 2 are 4, and then you get these numbers. If you notice, we don't have one for uh, d sub 3 because it's empty. It doesn't exist here. And so if you, if you look, we'll start with this one. You know, the things we're looking for is that this is a diagonal matrix that has the size of the d sub i as it is entry. Um, and then you can check for each of the other ones that they sum up to their respective uh, diagonal entry in the zero matrix. And then same for here. So this one's relatively easy because there are only 18 functions in that field that qualify. And so this is actually, you could almost do this by hand if you wanted to in an hour. You could just check all these out. Um, and actually, if you look at your graph, that is the graph that corresponds to the function V3. So that's a Cayley graph of the Ben function that you guys have there. Um, yeah, like I said, we use the computer for this to calculate all these, but if you really wanted to, if you had two hours with nothing to do, you could just kind of sit down and do this on your own, and you'd just prove something that no one has written down yet. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then our next result, where we bump up uh, a dimension, we go to GF3 squared to GF3. Again, same assumptions. We start with even Ben functions that send zero to zero. So uh, we have two cases again. Uh, the first case, d sub 1 equals 6, d sub 2 equals 12, and then your intersection numbers follow. And again, you can check uh, diagonal. All of these sum up to their respective uh, orders in this matrix here. So that's one case. And then the other case is uh, d sub 1 equals 12, d sub 2 equals 6, and then again, it, uh, it follows this. So, the problem with this one, uh, what, as we'll, we'll show later, is that there aren't just 18 of these functions. There are over 2,000 of them. So again, you can't just you can't just do this kind of calculation the way we did with the GF3 squared case. Uh, so in order to prove this, do a few more boring definitions <laughs> and theorems. Uh, this one's nice. So if we start with our bent function f, 
and uh, a lot of the same qualifications on the D size. And then we have a linear function phi. We can compose f with phi to create another bent function g that preserves all of the same characteristics. So g produces a wave partial difference set with its with its uh, level curves, and then the Schur rings are isomorphic, which is awesome because then intersection numbers remain the same across any composition with a linear function. And then next, another definition on group action, which we use in the proof of the uh, second result. Uh, if you have a, a multiplicative group in a set, you say that G acts on the set if there exists a map such that uh, you know these, these things happen. Um, and so an orbit, again, is another term we use in the proof. It's just a set of the form uh, rho of G and X where you hold X constant, so that's the orbit of X. So with all that in mind, we're going to show the proof for that second result and then jump into the conclusion and ask some other questions at the end. So we start with the set of all functions such that f is even, f sends 0 to 0, and we say that the degree of the algebraic normal form is at most 4, because it's been proven that bent functions don't have a degree higher than 4, so there's no need to consider anything else besides that. And we calculated that there are over 500,000 of those, so it's a, it's a rough starting block, but we'll get down there. So we're going to call B the subset of bent functions in E, and then we say that uh, G is our set of linear automorphisms, and F is equivalent to G if and only if F is sent to G under some element of G, like we talked about earlier when we compose one of these linear maps to our bent function. So after we get down there, we define the signature, which is just the sequence of the cardinalities of the level curves that we look at. And we know that um, because the Schur rings are preserved and the weighted partial difference sets are preserved under the action of G, all of the functions in an equivalence class have the same signature. And we know that across all equivalence classes, there are, there are 281 total. But it's nice because only four of them consist of bent functions, so those are the only ones we need to consider. Uh, and then we just label the classes B1 through B4. Uh, like I said, um, none of these, like the, the other ones outside of the bent functions, you know, we just kind of scrap them. So we've gotten down from over 500,000 functions to uh, a total of 2,340 functions. So we, uh, we know that two of the equivalence classes, based on computations, have a signature of 6 and 12. So d sub 1 equals 6, the size of d sub 1 equals 6, sorry, and the size of d sub 2 equals 12. And then we know that two classes have the opposite signature. And uh, we, were, we were able to find the algebraic normal forms for two of the classes. So b sub 1 can be, uh, the entire class of b sub 1 can be analyzed just on this function because of the ability to preserve all the same structures under that group action. And so we know that x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared represents every function in that class, whereas x1, x3 plus 2x2 squared plus 2x1 squared, x2 squared represents every function in b sub 2. And then we are also able to determine that b sub 3 is just all of the negatives of b sub 1, and then b sub 4 is all the negatives of everything in b sub 2. And so, like I said, we total at 2,340 functions to look at, but really all we have to do is check two of them, and we know everything else about that entire set B. And so we calculate the intersection numbers and the weighted partial difference sets with just these two functions, and we reach a conclusion that B sub 1 corresponds with the first condition, which is that d sub 1 equals 6 and d sub 2 equals 12, whereas b sub 3, its negative, corresponds to this condition. And then b sub 2 and b sub 4 don't actually uh, fall into this theorem because they don't generate weighted partial difference sets, and the, they don't generate the right structure for the partial difference sets. So what we know is from a set of over 500,000, there are only about 500 so, you know, bend functions that, that preserve this structure in our result anyway. And so, 
for further consideration, one of the things that we would hope to look at is instead of starting with a bend function and generating all these combinatorial uh, characterizations, trying to go the other way. So is it possible to just take a function, calculate all these different things, and then from that alone prove whether it's bent or not? We haven't been able to do that yet, but like I said, it's a young field, so there's always possibilities. And then another thing is taking some of the constraints off the functions. So the ones that we looked at were all even and uh, sent zero to zero. So another thing to consider is whether you can knock some of those, uh, those constraints off and get similar results, or if you get something totally different if you take that stuff off. And then another thing we looked at, too, is moving up to GF5. And uh, we actually reached uh, similar results. Obviously, they, the amount of functions that we have to study in that field increases a lot, just with the addition of two uh, variables to the vectors. But um, it's, it's something to look at because, again, if, if people can figure out GF3, you know, why not you know, add a few uh, elements to your field and see if you can get there. And then lastly, uh, some issues that come in with you know, characterizing the event functions is that suddenly you lose the secrecy that comes with them because they, you know, as, we, as far as I know now anyway, there isn't an easy way to break these unless you, you know, brute force for however long it takes. And so once we start characterizing these band functions, one of the issues that arises is, well, now that we can characterize them, is it possible to develop systems that break them easier? And so it's something to think about as people continue on in this field. Uh, so I'll just end on that. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, thank you for your attention. Thank you.